If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Hey, in this episode of Mind Pump. Hey, 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 hey. Well, for the first 50 minutes, we don't talk too much about fitness. We do our introductory fun time conversation. It's my favorite time. You like that, the fun time? Yes, fun time. We talk about Adam's shoe tag. Uh, on his shoe and why that is uh, something he doesn't want to take off. Apparently, yeah. apparently it's, it's a, not a security thing. It's part of the it's value style thing of his $800 shoes. Uh, then Justin and I talk about our adventure at the Nutcracker. No, yeah. it's not a wrestling move. Yeah. We actually went and saw the ballet show with our ball breaker. families and kids. Yeah. Uh, then Adam talks about how he butted heads with our YouTube uh champion danny <laughs> i don't know what to call him uh there was a little bit of a debate going on shout out to my boy yeah good Ooh. kid very good then we talked about everly wells omega-3 and b vitamins test so we all took uh more tests from everly well um adam and i did the vitamin b test let's see who has the best vitamin b levels doug and justin <laughs> did the omega-3 tests who's got the better Omega-3 fatty acids. I don't know the answer to that. Now, Everly Well provides tests that you could do at home for yourself. Hormone tests, food intolerance tests, nutrient tests. Very inexpensive, very convenient. They are one of our sponsors. If you go to everlywell.com, use the code MINDPUMP, you'll get 15% off any test. Does cheese have omega-3? It. I don't know. I'm screwed. Then we talked about the charity Vitamin Angels and how they're working with Organifi, if you go to Organifi.com forward slash mind pump and get the Organifi red juice, great for pre-workout energy, non-stimulant pre-workout energy, there will be a donation to Vitamin Angels to help with malnutrition around the awesome, world. Awesome, awesome cause. Uh, oh, don't forget, if you go to Organifi.com forward slash mind pump, use the code mind pump for 20% off. Then we talked about the study that showed that if you altered one specific gene in mice, they could eat whatever they wanted and not gain a single pound. Is there a new weight loss drug coming down the pipeline? Yeah, I don't see any uh, problems with that. We'll see what happens. At all. Then we get into the fitness questions. Uh, the first question was, if we all had limited amounts of time to spend in the gym, how would we train for maximum results? I think all of us agree that training more than once a day would probably be a part of that. Mm. But we go into some of our philosophies and theories on how to maximize results if we have all the time in the world. The next question is, how often should you change your exercise selection? In other words, how often should I switch from sumo deadlifts to deadlifts or from barbell squats to lunges? Is there a particular period of time that's going to benefit me the most? And is it the same for all exercises? Find out in that part of this episode. Mm -hmm. The next question is, if I'm just interested in building strength and muscle, can cardio benefit me at all? I think sometimes people get the impression that we're anti-cardio at all costs. Team no sweat. That is not true. Cardio does have a lot of health benefits and can contribute to your strength and muscle gains. You just got to do it right. And the final question, this person wants to know, if we're ever going to add a female voice to the podcast team, apparently uh, Justin's Justina voice. Yeah. Do it. Uh, I you know, uh, no, I'll do it. <laughs> Does it close? Listen to, yeah, wait for I, it. I already forgot it. Yeah. Wait for it. You yeah. got to wait for it. You got to listen to that part of the episode. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to I don't want to ruin it. Also, all month long, if you enroll in any of our MAPS fitness programs, you'll get a year of access to our f- private forum for free. So our private forum, we have lots of trainers on there uh, who can answer questions for you. Other fitness enthusiasts, there's lots of funny memes floating around on there. It's basically the podcast in private forum form. It's pretty awesome. You get free access to it for a year if you enroll in any of our MAPS programs at all. Now, if you have any questions on which MAPS programs is is right for you, just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. T-shirt time! And it's T-shirt time. Do it, Here it is. Oh, it's my favorite time of the week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We had over 40 reviews since Ooh, our last time. Over 40. Yeah. That's a good category, Justin. <laughs> yeah. You're getting there, buddy. <laughs> so our Facebook winners are Jed Harder, Rachel Lasser, and Rafael Rodriguez. Go our Harder. iTunes winners are NSN is the bomb diggity. Whoa. Yeah. Brookie Zebro, Physio Matt, Alexandra the Eng, Jen, Jenna 
Fur and Ronnie or Ronnie Chea. All of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Send your shirt size, your shipping address, and we'll get that right out to you. Yeah. Feels good to be a winner. Do you guys remember that show on TV with the puppets? Uh, and the crank yeah, anchors. The, the Muppets. Crank oh, anchors. Okay. And yeah. there was that one guy that was... Uh, oh my God, I barely I remember, remember that, that shit? Yeah, yeah. And, and then there was that one that he would crank call people and act like he was like special needs or whatever? Yes. I'm going to Hawaii, yay! Remember that guy? Yay! That would never make it on no, TV No, they today. can't do that anymore. That Right? They would no. shut that shit down. Yeah, oh. even if it's a puppet. Mm. Yeah, mm. you can't do that. Justin, I want you to sing that song that you were singing earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Old guy trying to be cool. Yeah. He's wearing shoes that are stylish now. Yeah. Probably not in a few minutes later, <laughs> but he's cool. Yeah. And that's what matters today. Well, who are you, yeah. talk- who are you talking about, dude? It's just a song? I don't know. It's, it's just a song. It's something I just wrote on the bro, fly. Bro, I, we, we pull up at the parking lot, right, together, and Adam comes out, and he steps out first with his with his right foot, and I'm like, oh, shit, those are cool shoes. Yeah. Left foot comes out, and he forgot to take off the fucking security tag or yeah, whatever that thing. Is. Or it's, it's not like a you take it tag. off and it's gonna like spray ink on you. Yeah, it's not that though. It's a no. tag. I'm like, did you forget? And I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, it, it's very visible. It's You're not keeping, like it's like a small. It's a thing. big orange yeah. plastic <laughs> yeah. thing on a shoe, which I feel would be uncomfortable walking. Yeah, explain in that. yourself. Why I, are, I, why aren't you taking that off? It's, it's you. You don't want to take it off. You he made a co- you made a comment that you were going to come snip it and would I be mad and I said absolutely <laughs> I, I would be fucking mad. It's just it's the signature that you know that it's an it's a pair of off white shoes and off white is a you cla- can't tell by looking at them. Uh, you no you may not know you may not because this so these are Prestos right so that's the the style the Nike style are Prestos and then what Nike has done is they've collaborated with designers right so there's a, I love that word Presto yeah <laughs> and then it happens, so, you know. so they collaborate and this is this has kind of been the in the in the shoe world it's been a um, it's been popular the last uh, I don't know and someone will correct me if I'm wrong but like the last eh, probably six to ten years somewhere in that range where these collabs have got really big where you you collab it's very similar to what we talked about a long time ago how Ed Hardy blew up when they were you know doing tattoos and they're when they're using tattoos to print on shirts and it was an artist who created the tattoo and then it gets printed on the shirt and that was the reason why it was so huge. Yeah, but that exp- tag can't possibly be a part of the style. That yeah, tag yeah. is because No, 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 the tag is part of the style. The tag is that's what that's so how they, you, the designer put the tag on. Yes, that's how you know Virgil has got his hands on it, like that he's d- redesigned this shoe, and so that really? tag signifies. Virgil I feel like he could have put his name on it or something instead. Well, that's yeah. a, that's his way of putting his name on it. So that mm. so you think of how art certain painters and certain artists do things to their art that that lets you know that that's a you know Thomas Kincaid. You guys know anything about yeah. Thomas Kincaid? Yeah, he, he do, does all those portraits that on the light you can see the lights there you go yeah. so the, his signature and his paintings is the way he paints it looks like the it lights illuminates. yeah the yeah. house lights are turned on so if i cut that off the plastic tag or whatever I would loses kill, its value yeah i would kill you no no wow. but it loses it because it loses its value yeah absolutely so i would so right now i could resell these shoes there's a market for yeah but you warm already doesn't matter there's a still it's like there's a stock market for shoes there's a market so, for that guy to just hop so you go to so you so go to wearing them doesn't take the value down sure it does as a little just oh absolutely Absolutely. I mean, if I wanted to, if I wanted to buy these shoes as an investment, I'm a, I like, I love, I'm a sneakerhead, so I, I like to wear my sneakers. I call you, a, it's like a shoe whore. Yeah, sure. Wow. Right? Better, better yeah. word. So yeah. you, if I, if I care Used. just about trying to make money off the shoes, then I would want to buy low and sell high. I would find a shoe, um, like the shoe. I would, you go to like StockX. Okay, you can download the app, and you can look up any any major shoe that's out there that's that's worth anything. And then and then you, I can watch it like a stock. I can see where it's at. And so I do this, and I pay attention to a shoe that I really like, like a, this shoe. The reason why I have it now is I've been watching it. I watched it dip down a little bit. Now it's it's lower than it's been for a while. I buy it, and now I could potentially wear this shoe for you know six months to a year, maybe longer. And it could go up so high that it, it worn, I can get more money for it than it was brand new. Or I can buy the shoe, keep it in the box, keep it not even opened up, keep all the tags, everything on it, and not even touch them, and resell them later for more money. Now, did you buy those brand new? Yes. You did? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah you mind, is it okay if I ask how much they cost or yeah. what they're worth? Yeah, they're Oops. $800. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah. You pay $800 on tennis shoes. It's crazy because, I mean, this obsession, like, were you really into uh, baseball cards when you were a kid, too? Cause, Big time in I mean, baseball. it just seems like a progression to that, it's right? It's totally exactly what it is. That's a great analogy. When I, and I was a big baseball collector when I was a kid. And I, and I was into sneakers, but I couldn't afford sneakers. So when I was a kid, um, you know, I was lucky if my grandmother bought me that the, the pair of Jordans. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, I think I, the very first Jordans I think I had were the the sevens. And when I bought mm-hmm. those, man, I put them up. I clean them every day after I wore them, and only wore them on special days. And you know, then I had my cheap shoes that my parents bought me that I wore all year round. And so I loved sneakers, but I could never afford to collect them mm-hmm. when I was a kid. Now I collected baseball cards. You, you know, it was twenty five cents for a pack of baseball cards when I was a kid, so I could collect those, and was into trading those and saving that. I stuff. remember a kid in school. This is a true story. Sixth grade, or seventh grade, maybe seventh grade. He had a brand new pair of Jordans, and another kid stepped on his shoes, and they got in a fight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah, that's, that. That's a no-no. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, I even knew that. Over it. Yeah. Shoes weren't like this, though. So when I was collecting baseball cards, I, I loved shoes, but there wasn't like a market for it. This is new. Like This is new since... And, and Jordan was really the one, was the one that created this market, where shoes would sell out, it would go away, and then that was it. So there was this frenzy around getting that pair of shoe when it when it released and it created Jordan's created such a frenzy that people then were buying going and waiting in line mm. buying them then turning around and reselling them for double the price like that week so, for those so is that tag on the side of your shoe the big orange one is that distinctive of that shoe or is it distinctive of other uh, other thank you shoes <laughs> like that over there? Doug loves your description. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to I'm trying to paint the picture because it is, it is very it's not bulbous. Well, I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not making fun. I find it fascinating, to be quite honest. It, and the reason why I'm explaining it that way for the audience is it's not a tag that's like a fabric tag that's attached to your shoe. It's literally a big like, plastic zip tie. Yeah, it's like a fire engine. No uh, tag. Yeah, and it's like a zip tie looking thing. Yeah, yeah. Around your yeah, shoe. you know, like on a, on a fire extinguisher. That's what I meant. Not fire engine. Fire yeah. extinguisher tag. <laughs> yeah. The tag that you would you would rip off a fire extinguisher. Yes, so that's what it is. Uh-huh. Is it distinctive to that one shoe, or is that a Nike thing for so that, other shoes? It's no. It's a. It's distinctive to the artist. Got it. Okay. So well, you, that makes sense. So any any uh-huh. shoe that he has he has collabed with Nike and because he does he does other collabs besides Nike. So there's other there's a couple other brands that he's done things with. If he's done something with the, a collab with that shoe, that tag will be on there. Okay. And it's normally like- well, an, See, that makes more sense now because when I saw it, I'm like, is this the same thing as leaving the sticker on your hat or- No, you know that, I mean? that's, right. that's, and I wouldn't do that. You see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a trend. Can I see turn your shoe that's, foot again? That's a trend that kids that kids do. Now this, this what, like you brought, you, you gave the analogy of like, uh, mm. you know, this is the artist. So that would be like you taking something that an artist signed and you scratching his name off. Now of it. it makes sense. Mm. Right. So, now it makes so when you sense. made the comment about cutting the tag, yeah, I yeah. would punch you in your face if you <laughs> <laughs> because then you would take my shoe that that was worth that much money, and you would instantly devalue it uh, significantly by doing that. In fact, I don't know. Because now that I'm looking closely, I can see on that. Do you like write his name on that? Is that what that is? Uh, what you mean on the actual tag? Yeah, yeah. It says it's well. It's not his name. It says Off White Co Collab. Okay. Now is it? Is because I know it's on your lace. That means it can come off. Oh yeah, I could take it off. So what is do some okay. All right, and yeah. is that where it's supposed to go, now, or some, can you put it any part of the shoe? Now, some, what are people doing? You know, it's it, it. This is where it came on the shoe. I just it. leave it. I just okay. leave it where it's at, and then wear and and wear the shoe. And you know, there, I've t- I've thought about like just unlacing it, taking it off, saving and, it. yeah, saving it. Uh, and maybe there comes a time where it's not in style to keep it or to have it on your shoe. So or this whatever. is how the kids are wearing them. Not it's. I think it's less of a kids thing because there's not a lot of kids that probably unless you're fucking a rich kid. Well, right? I mean, but, kids for me is you know anybody younger than me is a kid. Unless you drive an Audi or something. Like well, that. yeah, right. it's. I mean, I think Justin did it, said it perfectly. It's it's really just an evolution of somebody who's really into collecting things, and then you also are a sneaker person, right? I, it's like grown up baseball cards. You know, I'm not going to go collect baseball cards. I could still collect baseball cards, but I'm not, I don't follow the sport enough in it, but yeah. I follow sneakers well, enough. Well, at least there's value in it now, too. There's like a market for us. Interesting. Well, and and that is the part that makes me justify it, right? Yeah. Like if it was, 
I probably wouldn't have this crazy shoe collection if all of them, once I opened the box and put them on, all of a sudden were worth, you know, I wouldn't go buy $800 shoes if they were worth, you know, nothing after I wore them. But it's crazy how they've become so sought after that you can wear a pair of these sneakers, take good care of them, and somebody that is looking for that pair four or five years. Is there anything similar like for women in terms of shoes or dresses? I'm oh, absolutely. So I, you know, I get uh, I get uh, Christian Louis Vuittons for Katrina um, that are very rare. So like, I'll, again, they'll have a design or something. Like one of my favorite pairs that I bought her is um, were this pair called Winter Trash. And the, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very nice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the, and the look to them, My they, favorite look. They, they, it's the design of them has like the, looks like there's all these like pieces of trash and it, it sounds really terrible. They look great and they have all these great colors. And so you can wear them with a lot of outfits and dresses, but that, that shoe only so many of them were made, right? And it's rare and it was different and it's so unique and different. And if it ends up being a style that looks, and that's how all this stuff works too, right? Just because this guy, you know, Nigel does a, a designs a shoe doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be worth tons of money. Like he has shoes that are only worth like hmm. two, 250, but then he has some pairs that are worth 5,000. Five and the market thousand? determines all that. Exactly. Of the, course, the market always exactly. Is. So when a, when a badass style, well, I don't comes, know if he comes out with like, oh, these are five thousand. You know, like he's determining the price point. No, the market does. The right. market completely does. Like, so there's a pair I really want. So I have the white and the black Prestos. Then there's the. Those are called the off whites. Yes. Yeah, I learned that from uh, from just overhearing you guys talk. All the time, <laughs> yeah. You and Taylor. So the the ones I really like, I just I won't I won't pay fifteen hundred dollars for them, but I those are the ones I want. But that just shows you it's because I really everyone really wants those. They are badass. Have like, you made any money off your shoes? No. See, that's just it. It's just like I never made any money off of my baseball cards. So you've got tens of thousands of dollars worth of shoes. I don't know. I've never had. That's a good question. I I think tens of thousands, probably, mm. maybe maybe ten thousand, maybe somewhere around. I don't know. That's a fucking good question. I did just talk to Katrina though. I mean, you know, if and when the time comes that, you know, we get pregnant and have a kid, that room, I have a whole room dedicated to shoes. So uh, I'm not I'm not so tied to them that if I had a child in my life, I would not get rid of them. So I would pass them on if they're worth money. Well, possibly. Like, so what I would do is I would pick my, my top 30 to 50 that I that are the most valuable and that I wear the most. So mm -hmm, I would pick mm -hmm. the because I got a lot of them that are I mean, I have shoes that are worth thirty five hundred dollars that. I wear. I think I I can count on one hand. I mean, like it's there's special shoes I wear when I go to fucking Vegas on a one off trip and wear those. Like those aren't doing me a lot of good. They're valued at thirty five hundred dollars. Like I could probably get fifteen hundred quick for them used and put that money in my pocket and I I wouldn't miss them that much. But then there's other pairs I really like are really rare and that I. So when you're wearing a pair of shoes like this, most people I would assume have no idea what they are, right? But I'm sure you run into people who are like you. Do they come up to you like, oh, you got the- Always. I never yeah. wear a pair of these shoes and not get a comment in the day. Really? Oh, yeah. It's just like driving a, a, a classic car. Like totally. My yeah. <laughs> I, used to experience, I used to experience that all the time, and then my, my fucking truck died. Right. Yeah. And there's, there's, you know, when you drive something like that, uh, you could pull up next to someone who knows nothing about vehicles, and they just think it's a truck. Yeah. But then you pull up to a, a, a guy- Who's who loves classic Gearhead. cars? Yeah, yeah, that knows the year, no appreciates the little detail that you've done to it, and go and will will follow you to a gas station to tell you. I get that. Like, mm. yeah. if I'm at a restaurant, like, I was calm just down. this just happened. I was wearing my Air Max uh, 97s, and I'm I'm at the restaurant, and you know I'm we have a, a waiter that's serving us, but a, a waiter all the way across comes all the way over to comment to, about my shoes. Like, oh, bro, those are dope shoes. And that's, so guys commenting on each other's shoes. Oh, I really... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, every once yeah. in a while I get girls that are like, oh, I like your shoes. You know, that say something like that, but it's normally other guys. It's just like fucking working out in bodybuilding. You get more compliments from a guy on that's your... That's true. Yeah, Dude, I don't... Great caps. Yeah, when, when, I, yeah. when I was jacked in the gym and wearing, walking yeah, around... no and, girls are coming yeah, up Yeah, no too. girls are coming up and like, oh my God, you're my, it's guys. Guys, guys come over... Like poking at your yeah, biceps. Dudes you know, come oh, over and be like, hey, man, nice physique. Yeah, bro, your tricep are looking getting crazy. It. Yeah, getting yeah, after it, huh? So, yeah, it's, yeah. It's reminds so, me of that and scene. They slap your butt. There's like, one. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you too went far, too far. Too far. There's one scene in Pumping Iron that's a little uncomfortable. I don't know if you remember it, but there, he's working out real hard. He's doing a squat session or whatever. Then they go in the shower, 
and they're in the shower and they're obviously naked and they're like and Arnold's like flexing like this and he's like <laughs> showing his bicep to Franco and they're all talking about like the, and I remember as a kid I was like what the fuck's going on <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing <laughs> what's going on yeah how did this turn into got a little this too far. Uh, scene it yeah. is, is interesting well I mean what is the this, this, this stat on that You do you know what it is it's really high the amount of bodybuilders that are um, that are gay. There's a high number of them. Is it really? Yeah, it's. Uh, you should Google it, Doug. Hmm. So, uh, look it up. I know it's a, a much higher stat than I ever thought. And what I always wonder is how many of them were gay before they got into the sport and how many of them became mm. gay And because you just Interesting. you turn into this person who is so much into the body and you begin yeah. to worship you the same sex. I feel, like, I feel like you just love yourself so much and you're like, oh, that kind of looks like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think... Come here, get over here. I don't yeah. think it's a higher percentage. I think it's a perception of a higher percentage. I, I don't think it's true. I think it's one of those like... No, it's high. You, know, you think so? It, oh, yeah. No, it's like a, like the 40 percentile. Like 40 percent of men are not gay. It's like it's... it's. Where did you get the statistic? Yeah, I don't know. I'm asking Doug to Google right now. That's why we have Doug. What percentage of bodybuilders are gay? Yeah. Go- Google that, Doug. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I feel like it's a... I'm totally throwing random numbers. I feel like it's a stereotype because, you know, when you're a kid and you have pictures of men in posing on your walls parents are like oh i think that no didn't we didn't we talk to sean ray about this wasn't this something we? i think a lot of sexual deviancy happens in the bodybuilding world but i think that's true of any anything where you have a lot of drug use i think that you start to see people kind of dabble and high testosterone i think what happens is you become uh very open with your body and comfortable with your sexuality. Yeah, yeah, because, I use the wrong word. You're right. Yeah, and I, that's what I, I think that's yeah, what absolutely. happens. And then there's probably people that are in the spectrum, right? Because we talk about this. I don't think there's a, anybody that's, uh, I mean, I, I don't think there's straight people, gay people. I think there, well, I think there's straight people, and gay people. And I think there's everything in the in the in the spectrum in the sure. in between. Sure. And I think there, what happens when when you're in the the bodybuilding thing and you're into bodies and you're posing in underwear and you get an airbrush with your buddy. Yeah, you just you <laughs> that, you become very comfortable with your yeah. sexuality and looking mm-hmm. at other men naked, and then mm-hmm. it never it doesn't it become it's no longer taboo to do that. And then all of a sudden you go, well, maybe I'm into that. You know, mm-hmm. maybe I'm more into that than I realize. And so I think there's a, a higher percentage than you I think. Could use a little more bronzer yeah there's a there's a uh, there's a, a whole uh, uh, what's the word um subculture in that bodybuilding world where the guys will flex and pose and oil up for other See, wealthy gay men okay now this is what i've heard and i know that i i don't know if a lot of it's like urban legends or whatever like no, it's but, true but yeah as far as lots lots of the uh um y- you know the judges or, or like people hosting these these competitions had ulterior motives in terms of like getting you know some of the competitors to do things mm. well i know there's like i said there's there's men that will flex and oil who are who don't consider themselves gay. muscle worship and they'll do yeah they'll yeah. do that kind of stuff but there's also weird stuff on the on the female side where these really muscular women will get paid oh, yeah. to like pin like crush stuff yeah or no like pin men oh yeah or yeah. like uh, choke them out or wrestle something. them yeah. or put them over their shoulder and carry them around the house and shit like that yeah it's <laughs> legit. This is a, no it's a real Su- super beta dude hey it's sure. great man hey whatever floats your boat it's yeah. hey that's the same here as long as nobody gets hurt anyway. <laughs> Let's it's change the so subject. Crazy. We uh, this yeah. weekend, this weekend we went to uh, uh, Jessica, I, and the kids, and met up with Justin and and, uh, and Courtney and the kids, and we went and watched. Oh, you uh, did Nutcracker, the Nutcracker. Yeah, yeah. that's right, Ball Breaker. Yeah, yeah. how was Same it? Thing, right. Well, uh, parking was insane. It drove me crazy. Justin got in an hour after the show started. Yeah. I saw half what? of the uh, entire performance. That's how bad the parking yeah. was. I forgot, like it's it's Christmas time, and so I, I thought San Francisco would have been hate the, the city, dude. Dude, the city's terrible. That's why I hate going to the city. I just no, no, can't, it's San Jose. Man. I can't. This is San Jose, downtown San Jose. Oh, this was downtown. San Jose? Everything yeah. because there's there's also like an event. I think there's you can go like ice skate, and there's like a, a little. Oh, uh, you're just an asshole. Then this is our town. You should know better. Listen. <laughs> I don't ever go downtown. I'm, this isn't my town. Uh, I guess you're you know, right. I'm you're not, Santa Cruz I'm not, guy. I'm not the San Jose guy. Sal, obviously. Yeah. What did you guys do? Did you guys Uber in or something? No, I drove. And uh, I found it took me 25 minutes to find parking. I wow. finally get in. And then I text this guy after the first part of the show is over or whatever, you know, yeah. intermission. I'm like, hey, what did you think of the show? He's like, I just got in. <laughs> it was an hour later. Dude, I ended up driving because I, I went to five different parking garages and they kept moving me along. 
and they just closed one down. And I was like, ah, oh, I was getting so pissed. And I was like waiting in the last one and just doing the move where you wait there to see if people will come back to their car and then try and like dart into their spot. And I tried that like two of them unsuccessfully. And then it was just like, you know what? Like, I'm not even going to get like all crazy and heated about this. I'm just going to go back to the studio, which was like 10, 15 minutes, you know, from there get an Uber and then like drop me off in front of the, the, the center. And I was just like, this is so crazy. Did you, dude. Courtney and the kids have to Uber back here then afterwards? <sighs> yeah, we did. Oh shit. And probably illegally. Cause uh, my youngest, but we won't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's cool though. So it's the San Jose center of performing arts. So they put it on every year or whatever. Yeah. And I love watching uh, performances. I, I, not that I, I would watch it all the time because I'm not like a fan. I'm not much of a ballet guy, but I appreciate the yes, art of it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Like I can sit there and, I, and I'll study the bodies and how they move. And man, th these ballet dancers, the way that they utilize their feet is so fucking fascinating. The strength they must have in their feet well, to come up on the tips of their toes and bounce around and then pop up and down left. I was like, yeah. man, that would destroy me. It's it's a lot like too, even with gymnastics and um, just how they can control their body. But you know how difficult it is. But then they just do it so gracefully. But then they don't look like they're struggling. Mm -mm. Like they do all that at once, and they're yeah. like smiling through it and everything. You're just like, dude, I know, I know that was challenging for you. Don't yeah. don't most of them end up like destroying their feet from that? You're, oh, 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 they get all kinds. You of ever seen a ballet a ballet dancer's foot? Yeah, yeah, fucked up, right? Oh, the toes, yeah, because yeah. of the the training involved, it's it's brutal, it's yeah. absolutely brutal. But I can't think of because we always talk about foot strength and stuff. They must have the strongest muscles of their feet of all time. You'd think so, yeah. That's what I, that's what I would think. And then there were some men in there that were that were doing it with the you know with the with the with the rest of the people performing, mm -hmm. and they lift the women up in the air. And these aren't massive women. I mean, they're small women. But still, they're doing it and they're moving and dancing, mm -hmm. maintaining incredible stability. And they're not super muscular dudes. No. It's just such a very specific form of strength. It's very impressive. What did you? What did the kids? How they receive it? Were they into it? No, boring. Like what did you? What did the kids yeah. say? Yeah, talk, what, what about your boys? Are they well, like? You got, you yeah, got two, so, yeah, you got two gun he, shooting fucking exactly tree Thank climbing you. boys. How was that for them? They managed. They were, uh, they were glad they were an hour well, late. His, but <laughs> the second half, when I got there, basically, like they were, they were a little like squirming. And then, like my youngest, he brought a watch ahead of time just because inevitably he knew he was going to get bored, and it has like lights on it and stuff. And so I was, I was watching him throughout the performance, and then inevitably you see him like looking on his watch, and he's like messing with the lights, and like he was like super bored. But my oldest was getting stuff out of yeah, it. Yeah, so. bro, your oldest cracks me up because he has that tuxedo that he wears. I know he loves to dress up. He's he's my guy for that. He goes like all in. You know, he's like he wanted the tuxedo. I'm like, I'm laughing because it doesn't even matter if it's like the Thanksgiving dinner thing. If, yeah. if like whatever we're doing where there's like a group of people, he's like, I'm putting on my tux. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> it's like, all right. Does he, he really into dressing up nice? Yeah. Yeah. Like that's his thing like right now. And I, 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 I kind of remembered being like that when I was a kid, you know, for a brief moment, I was like, you know, if I had to go to church or something, I was like wearing a little suit and like, really? a tie and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Cause so I just wanted to be like the guy. Yeah. No, my kids were fine. My daughter was tired because she had a sleepover the night before at a friend's house and, uh, they, they don't sleep when you have a sleepover with nine year old girls. Right. They literally don't sleep, so she was totally exhausted. But they otherwise enjoyed it. It was it was a lot of fun. I I really like watching. Like I said, I like watching live performances because I study them and I break them down, and then I start to. I, I, I mean, as an adult, as a kid, I hated it. I could sit there and get bored out of my mind. But as an adult, mm -hmm. I start to think of all the all the moving pieces. Like the the stage changed several times. Yeah. And it was, and I'm looking at how they they're able to move the stage and change it, and it's brilliant in the way they design it. Um, so I, that's what really fascinates me. So, so out of everybody that went, you know, including the adults, adults and kids, who probably loved it the most and who probably liked it the least? Mm. Mm. Jessica probably liked it the most. I, 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 for us, she's she's so into art, you know, and stuff like that. Just having traveled with the circus, she loves watching performances. Yeah, this seems like this would be up her alley. She loves it. She absolutely loves it. She's just super glued to the thing the whole time. I'm cool with it. I don't know. My daughter was tired, so she was kind of out of it. My son probably doesn't like it. I don't, or maybe he likes it now because now he's into girls. Well, I don't know. Maybe. I remember yeah. watching. I remember watching. We had friends who were ballet dancers when I was a kid, and we would have to go. And right around 13, 14, I started to like. Feel like, things. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like going. Tinglies. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. 
Look at her. Yeah, look at that body move. Yeah. yeah. What about, does Courtney uh, a big fan? Yeah, she likes, yeah, I think she'd probably be the one that, that enjoyed it the most. Um, and then maybe my oldest and then probably me. And then probably, yeah, my mm, youngest. He was just not feeling it. He's, he's very much of a rough and tumble, you know, like smash it up, you know, shoot things kind of kids. So. Yeah, and the fight scenes in the Nutcracker, I think they could have made him more fighty. Yeah, this more, was more, more, yeah, more fighty. fighty in yeah. the fight. Less dancey. Is that going in the, the, <laughs> more fighty. Is that going into the library? Yeah. They, they do a lot of things where they're like, Pro, like, oh, I killed him. But they project like, like their fingers out there. And they're like, yeah, it's like like little magic moves you yeah. know, with their hands. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. You Ma- go on, would you go again? It's very dramatic. Would you go again? Maybe next year. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Maybe yeah. next. You guys are the ones that invited us. I know. This yeah. is all Courtney's you know contribution she mm-hmm. was the one that uh thought it'd be a good idea. and i i agreed i thought it was a great idea we now, should try it do you like this kind of stuff adam i'm open to it like we so i, I had a girlfriend that was really into the play scene and so i went to i went to more plays with her that i ever been in my entire life and um she got me to like them like she's you know when she explained to me before she's like it's no different than like a movie if you just you got to go to the ones that you would enjoy like if you like humor and comedy and sat and, and or you like suspense or you like like whatever storyline you tend to gravitate towards like with movies there's plays that will that will uh, you know mirror that right so if you just get introduced to some play that everyone says is great but it's great because of the art you know artistic side of it well maybe you're not somebody that like cares about that side of like movies and you want something that's more action or more whatever so she goes you know understanding and learning uh, what plays are, are are like what will really change your experience and so I had a really good experience she she kind of she obviously she knew me and so she took me to a few of these different plays mm-hmm. that I actually really enjoyed I thought oh wow these were way different than you know like there was one that was like super tons of profanity and nudity and shit talking oh. and I was like whoa I wasn't ready for something like that in a play I, I just had something totally uh, different that I had envisioned and so I had a great experience so yeah Katrina and Katrina was just in New York and she went out and, and she saw a play so there's a few of them that like I've heard Wizard of Oz is really good or Oz I think is what it is is, is supposed to be really good Wicked I hear is really good Wicked is really good Wicked yeah. was good actually. those are all ones that like that are on my list that I'd like to see um, but you know what I don't like is the experience what you guys just said like lots of people trying to funnel into a room and parking and all that. It was gnarly. Yeah, like, I think if I were to do it, I'd probably do it somewhere in New York and go stay downtown and then walk to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or go do that, like, if, you, if you're going to have it, like, do it. To be fair, I may have had a different experience if I wasn't so, like, frustrated and pissed off. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like I came back and I'm just like, oh, my God. That was a nightmare. You're like me. That's That would that would affect the oh, whole experience. Oh, dude, I would have driven home. Right, the, that, I thought about it, but I was like, I'll just keep driving around until it's done. Yeah, that's, so to me, that like if I <laughs> if I had a terrible experience getting there, <laughs> and, and then it. and then the and then it doesn't wow me to death, I'm probably like Bleh, about mm-hmm. it. But if you know, we like I I think if Katrina and I were to go do something like that, we would make a a night and a weekend out of it. We're like, okay, let's go fly in or let's go stay at a place that is literally next to the event that we can walk to it later on. Maybe have mm-hmm. dinner before and make a whole night. I can. I see think it's it. fun. Like we're. I think the reason behind it, we're trying to find new ways to kind of create our own family's sort of rituals and especially with the holidays and stuff. And so like one other thing was um, Courtney made a uh, uh, stolen. So it's like a, a what it, it was stolen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is it? Yeah. It's, it's a German bread. So it's like, a, Oh wow. It has, yeah, it has like a nuts and, and raisin, but it's like very, it's very uh, not like super sweet, but it's, I don't know, it's a traditional bread. Oh, there it is right there. It was actually really good. Now, would you, would you put butter on that? What do yeah, you, do you put that? butter on it. Oh, yeah. hell yeah. I put a, f- a shit ton of butter Did you bring on. Adam and I some stolen? <laughs> I could, actually. We have a whole loaf that we're kind of waiting, but there's, um, we grew up with uh, patita, which was another uh, traditional bread. I think it's from Denmark, but um, my grandma used to make that. And uh, so anyway, so we're just kind of going through this process of like trying to establish our own thing, you know, with our family. And so I think that uh, next year, I think I'm going to try and uh, pull one of my own ideas out there and throw it and see if it sticks. So. Yeah, we do. Uh, we drive around and look at Christmas lights. That's one of the things that we do. And the kid will listen to Christmas music. Yeah, the kids will have one. hot cocoa in the car. Yep. And we'll just drive around looking at lights. And 
it's fun. You know what I mean? It's a it fun is. thing for the yeah, kids. Yeah, it's that- good. And it, it's like, it's it's cool when you get into it and, you know, it's not like the last week right before Christmas. It's like you're kind of leading up into it. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. Adam, you, you did a bunch of uh, filming, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, with uh, Danny over at um, at the Red Dot. Man, mm-hmm. I love that gym. Isn't it a great place? It's a great-looking gym. I really, I really, really like Scott and CeCe, too. They're just, they're great people. I think they're running, a, they got a great uh, environment over there. I think the, the facility is beautiful. I think they have very high-quality trainers. They're, most of them are all big fans of the show. And so they just, they were, they, they took us in open arms, allowed us to use their facility on Sunday. And that was awesome. I'm excited to see the footage that comes out of that because one, I'm, I'm really happy with, uh, the work that Danny is doing right now on the YouTube. I think the kid was just, was born for this. Um, although we did get in a little bit of a, I saw that you guys got, (laughs) you guys you guys got a little debate. A little yeah. shit. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So we have this thing. Young, right? young lion trying to tell old lion what time it is. Yes, he was. And you know what? Like, uh, And he's smart as a whip, you know? So it's not like, uh, you know, he's a dumb kid who's who's just spouting off a bunch of bullshit. He's, he's very educated. Kid's got his Kines degree. He's got CSCS. He's got 30 national certifications. Brilliant kid. That's why we have him on the team, right? Um, but we had just written, you know, or you just wrote, Sal, this um, uh, starter kit that we're doing for hard gainers. It's a free a free thing that we're we're putting out there, and it's just to help that that skinny guy who's been struggling to put size on, and you know what exercises should they be doing. And so we went through each you know muscle group and said you know these are staple moves that you've got to have. And if you're a hard gainer, like this this single exercise, this is the single best exercise that you could do for for that muscle group. And one of the ones obviously for back, we we all agree is deadlift. And, um, you know, I'm in there and I'm, I kind of stay out. I'm just there to kind of oversee it, make the, make sure the flow is going. Taylor really runs it with Eli and they're kind of, and I'm just kind of overseeing and, and Danny is like off air and he's talking to Taylor. Okay. We're going to do this. The single best exercise for back is deadlift. And Danny's like, oh yeah, I'll do that. But I don't agree with it. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what do you mean you don't agree with it? Right. <laughs> wow. So I ask him that and then he starts getting, getting into, how oh it just it doesn't uh, isolate the lats the, as well as this movement and that movement and I go whoa, whoa wait okay wait a second are we talking about isolating yeah, the lats about isolating or are we talking about the single best exercise for your back as far and, and he goes it doesn't matter either way I still think that you know a pull up with supersede a barbell row would be better and we're going back and forth and and like it was I couldn't get through to him like it was just it, it, impossible he it's almost like and you said it best Sal it's there, there's something that there's definitely this thing that happens as when you have when you're young like that and very smart is you get uh, too smart for your own good, and and that too is too smart to realize when you're being dumb. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know it, it really it really is, and you and and just plain out fucking experience will end up trumping that one day. And you know once you've trained enough bodies and you've applied enough of your theories uh, to an, uh, you know enough groups of people it becomes very transparent. Like, wow, uh, this was something that I've neglected for a long time because I had, a, I believe this camp, you know, and I, I, came, I teased him about being in the hypertrophy coach camp and, and, mm-hmm. you know, I got a lot of respect for that dude actually. And he puts out incredible content, but I was teasing him because he talks a lot about, you know, isolation and cable movements and really, you know, the importance of mind muscle connection. And I agree with all of that. Like, I mean, I was in that camp for a very long time. Like I spent a majority of my lifting career, you know, the, the bodybuilding, hypertrophy, pumping, isolating type exercises that sculpted much of my body. So, and who are you to come tell me that that's not one of the best ways to do it? Cause I saw great results, but I'll tell you what, Holy shit, when I began to deadlift, especially running singles, doubles, triples, five by five type of strength training for my back, my fucking back exploded. And mm-hmm. then what I realized even more so was then I went back to all those exercises that I I, I swore by and my strength would like doubled and tripled oh, yeah. in some of those movements. Mm-hmm. And so the argument that I was trying to make to him was, listen, the 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 CNS carryover that you get from deadlifting in comparison to all these movements you're arguing with me about is trumped so much that even if you're you if there's these studies that you're trying to quote and refer to of like oh more muscle activation in the lats by a dumbbell row or a, or a pull up or a barbell row than a deadlift like okay that's true but that deadlift 
has so much carryover spills, over, spills yeah. over into all those movements that you'll now be able to go back to those movements and be able to lift significantly more, which will also then compound the, the results. And it's not even fucking close, but no. he, I couldn't get him to budge. I couldn't get him to budge. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, dude, he, 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 he argued with me all the way to the end of it until I just... You know, so he, we agreed to disagree, and then he did the videos anyways. And then, you know, him and Taylor were making fun of me on the Mind Pump Instagram afterwards. Just, you know, Danny thinking he's so smart. Just, oh uh, my God. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. Still rolls. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> Lap on well, yeah. No, no, Get no, the man. fuck out of here oh, with that guy. Uh, did you guys end up mailing in those Everly Well tests, by the way? I did. I yes. did. In fact, I just got Are the, we all, did we my all Omega. Just, you did Omega. I did Omega. Okay, so last time you did Omega, yeah. and it was low. I'm hoping to see a, a, an increase. What have you done to change that? Well, I mean, begrudgingly, I've eaten fish like once a week for me. I literally hate fish. So so since you did the, because you took a test last time, your yeah. Omega 3s were lower than they should be. Yeah. Since then, you've been eating fish once a week. Yeah, and supplementing, so- Okay. Yeah. yeah see, this will be fascinating. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm I'm interested to see if supplementing and then just one little you know nutritional component that's a massive component obviously will make a difference. Okay. Now you and I, Adam, we did the B. Yeah. Test, we did B. Right? Yeah. We did B. And I'm not doing anything different right now. I want to. I I haven't never tested that. So I'm basically keeping things the same for me. I'm gonna test it, and then whether I'm high or low or whatever I'm at will decide dictate whether I change something nutritionally. Now that one I think is fascinating because now I did mine too, and I anticipate that mine will be good because I, I eat pretty well, and I think I eat a lot of foods that contain pretty full spectrum of B vitamins, and then I also supplement here and there uh, with with multivitamins, um, but. Low B is uh, you get a lot of these common symptoms you see in people like anxiety, um, kind of nervous system type disorders, pale skin, um, and it, you'll see this in people. And I, I, it's a, it's I'm so happy that they're doing this test because I think a lot of people are low in some of these nutrients, and it's mm -hmm. expensive to go get them tested at the doctor. I, you know, yep. I, I'm with and, and get and having your doctor write you a prescription for a test like that, they won't do it unless you're dying. I'm with you that I think I'm gonna be good, but I'm also but I'm also skeptical or not skeptical, but I'm also nervous because I thought I was gonna crush the omega test. Mm -hmm. Because I'm really good about that. Like I, I really I eat a I eat a lot of fish and when I don't, I make a conscious effort to supplement. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, when I take this Everly Omega test, I'm gonna be fine. And I remember I had been even supplementing that week uh, with omegas, and when I took the test, I was low. Yeah. So I was, I was like, that was a major wake Great. up call. I think there's an in, have to do a lot of work. I think there's an individual variance with, with oh, for all sure. this stuff. Of course, there's going to yeah. be. Like someone could eat the same amount of fish as someone else, and they'll have good markers, and other someone else will have lower markers. Mm -hmm. It could also be what you're, you know, what you may be undergoing uh, in terms of stress or training or illness or if you have gut issues. Mm -hmm. And so all this stuff is very individual. This is it's why this is why I think the the everywell everly well test is so important and I love that they make it so convenient and easy. I love that I can I have an app and so I can go back and look at all my tests. I can pay attention to what I was doing on the diet. Because a lot of people like myself, I'm sure think that they're eating well for oh I can't be lacking in that I gotta be fine but like you said mm -hmm. you know maybe I'm eating a lot compared to somebody else who doesn't need it as much mm -hmm. that just that just screams to me that wow it's really important that I'm not only aware of this but I'm probably needing to consume as much or more than the average person for that because the way my body responds to now it. my my omegas were good they were actually in the optimal range it said on the test but i've been supplementing with cod liver oil mm -hmm. and i take about three to four uh grams which is three to four capsules of it i've been supplementing with that for years now consistent it's probably one of my most consistent supplements i take it every single morning and so I would have been shocked had mine been low, but I think that may be why. Mm. And the reason why I supplement with it is, you know, years ago when I first found the, uh, was it the Weston A. Price mm -hmm. um, website, they were such big proponents of especially cod liver oil, and mainly because of the, the omega-3s, but also because it has a, it's a high level of natural vitamin D, right. which a lot of people are low in also. That's the one that, yeah, I was obviously concerned with because I just going about my nutrition and not, you know, uh, having fish as a regular part of my diet was already concerning, but yeah, the the level of of vitamin D was like uh, concerning for me too. So that's did you get that tested? 
<clears throat> that one, no, I didn't. But I just Did you get that tested. Yeah, thing? exactly. That would be another good follow up for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing about testing. I, you know, I, I'm one of those people that's like, oh, I know how my body feels, this, that, and the other. But you don't know for sure uh-huh. until your test, because you guys remember my testosterone t- uh, test and how much it jumped because I severely cut my cannabis usage, mm-hmm. or at least that's what I think caused that rise in in my testosterone. I wouldn't have known, and I did feel it a little bit, but I wouldn't have known it made that big of a difference had I not done that Everly Well test. So I think, I think it's really smart. I think if you're super into your health, um, I think it's smart to schedule some of these key tests with yourself a few times a year. Yeah, like I think that would be a smart protocol. And they're, you know, what is it going to cost you? A hundred bucks for a test or something like that? Oh, it's just or important. Even less. Yeah, it's important feedback and data to be able to kind of like really narrow down use an individual. And so, like, you can plan around that a lot more effectively. Yeah. You know, speaking of, of like nutrients and vitamins and things like that, um, maybe one of you guys can look this up. I actually meant to look this up before we got started, or maybe Doug, you can check for us. Are you familiar with what Organifi is doing with the the Vitamin Angels? No. What is that? So they're doing that. It's so cool. Again, uh, this just uh, I'm so glad we partnered with the companies that we did, just because all of them have such great little programs that they have going on, and they're they're always constantly trying to find a way to give back. And Organifi is doing this thing right now that every Organifi Red Juice purchase will help save a life. And they've partnered up with uh, a company called Vitamin Angels. And at Organifi, their mission is to unite the world through health and happiness. They're blessed to have the opportunity to partner with Vitamin Angels and expand their impact. So for every uh, jar of red juice sold, we can help save a child's life, providing the gift of nutrition to a malnourished child in need. Mm. It's such a simple yet powerful way to impact the world. So I, I didn't know anything about this, you know, and I ju- they just came up on my on my feed yesterday, and I wanted Doug or someone to to kind of dig into it. I had never heard of this company, Vitamin Angels, before, and they supposedly well, part- malnutrition is a big deal in a lot of developing nations, uh, mm-hmm. like low levels of vitamin A or vitamin D or vitamin E, or you know, because a lot of these kids in some of these countries will eat the same foods all the time just because of poverty or whatnot. Yeah. And so what uh, a lot of people will do, and I'm assuming Vitamin Angels does this as well, is they go in, they see what the deficiencies are, and then they give these kids- The supplements. And it, yeah. yeah, and they give them the supplemental nutrients. And it, when you have a nutrient deficiency and you fill it, it's life-changing. Well, we've talked about this, even for someone who's not, we're not trying to save lives, just the impact that it makes on those normal listeners right now who are trying to chase goals of, you know, getting more muscle or burning body fat, it, it blew. And that was really way later in my career did I start to piece this together because I was constantly chasing the performance supplements and trying everything under the sun to get the competitive edge. And never once was I looking at my vitamin D, my vitamin mm-hmm. B, my omegas. But the more I started to look deeper into that stuff and actually if I was going to supplement, instead of taking the latest fat burner this or muscle, muscle builder this, like instead of doing that, going, okay, where am I deficient in? Right. And supplementing that way, and what a huge difference that played in my results. And it was like, oh, that's crazy. One, it was way cheaper to do. Two, uh, it taught me more about my diet and my patterns, the way I eat. And I could also try and get a majority of that nutritionally. And then I could use my supplement only when I needed it. For example, like mm-hmm. I talk about with fish, if I'm not getting it two or three times in a week, that's when I would supplement for it. Mm-hmm. Where I think people, if they were to start doing that, they would see way more results than than they, they would anticipate, opposed to always chasing the performance supplements. I had an aunt who was in her, I want to say in her early 70s, and she was having trouble uh, walking and moving. And the problem with advanced age, one of the problems is sometimes issues will pop up and they don't get diagnosed because they're older. So, you know, doctors and people around them say, oh, you're just... You know, the, you're you're just losing mobility because you're getting older, or you're losing, you know, your your coordination because you're getting older. Well, I had an aunt that was losing. She her her gait was starting to change, and people thought, oh, you're just getting older, whatever. She had a friend who was a doctor who took some tests and found that she was low in some nutrients, and I think it was B vitamins, if I'm not mistaken. Now that we're on that topic, and um, her coordination started coming back, and her mobility started coming back. It was all. It was a fucking nutrient wow. deficiency, which is, you know, today's day and age is so easy to to fix. You just take a, a vitamin for some of the stuff or an injection of a vitamins, mm-hmm. and she was able. She started moving and functioning better. 
But had had we not looked into that, nobody would have ever known. We would have thought it was just due to old did you, age. Did you see what Doug just pulled up? I didn't know. I didn't know that it was the number one leading cause of death in children. Malnutrition. Yeah. Wow. Damn. And and then what's the score thing you just pulled up right now, Doug? Is that like as far as it's it's a, a thing that ranks uh, charities? Yeah, I went over to Charity Navigator. So anytime somebody brings up a charity, maybe I'm thinking about donating to something. I want to kind of find out, you know, if they're legit. Number one. And how they're using their mon- money. And this one seems ultra legit. It's got a financials of 97.5, accountability, transparency, 100%. So it looks Oh, I didn't even know this yeah. website existed. What a oh, cool website. Cause yeah. he, he, and this, Doug, how'd you know about this? I've never even heard of this. Uh, I think I found it years ago when I was looking into some companies that what an impor- were approaching me. Right? What an important tool especially in today's age, especially since this is becoming a way that people build mm-hmm. businesses, right? This is becoming a strategy. It's uh, almost anywhere if you 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 hear these business seminars now, one of the first things they, they cover and talk about is, you know, building something that finds a way to give back. This is becoming mm-hmm. mandatory mm-hmm. for people that they want that. And I, we talked about Tom's being one of the first companies to really you know, explode this this new wave. But I like this because I'm a huge fan of private charities. Um, uh, you know, government isn't nearly as efficient. And many times, you know, when government gives money to other countries, it goes from the poor people here to the rich people somewhere else. Um, private charities like this, uh, I, I really like, especially now that there's these, I didn't know this site existed as well, but I, I knew of other things where you can look in and see where's the money going, mm-hmm. who's getting it, because there's nothing worse than, Donating to a charity and then finding out that it's not it getting all went to the founder. Yeah, yeah, that would that's extremely infuriating to to me when I see something like that because it's preying on people's empathy and compassion, mm-hmm. which I think is. And then what it happens? It's, yeah, it's the worst. And what happens is it destroys people's confidence and stuff like this, and then people don't want to help. Right, then they're hesitant to to give. Yeah, so this is a really cool website. Yeah, isn't that neat? <clears throat> it says it star ranks it and then it ranks it out of a hundred. And that that makes me feel good. Right? Oh, that's very hundred cool. ninety seven ninety eight. That's that's dope. I want to look closer on that. So that's great. So basically, it's it's tied into the red juice specifically that they're yeah. going to donate. Right. So, so by f- that, then they donate. Yes, okay. that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good red juice is good for pre workout for people wondering what that's good for. Yep. Um, all right. One last thing before we get into the the fitness questions, I've gotten tagged probably a hundred thousand times. Not now. I'm exaggerating. A lot of times <laughs> to the study that came out. So researchers, uh, here's the title of the of the article, and by, there's a lot of articles done on this one, su- one this one study. It's going mainstream. Researchers might have finally cracked the code to gorging without consequence. Okay, so they've isolated a gene in mice that when they disable it, the mice can oh, gorge. I, heard, I saw wait, wait. this. Did you guys get tagged, I get on, tagged this? on this too? Can you okay. define gorging? I'm so glad you're. You're they going. just allow them to eat a shit ton of high calorie foods for prolonged periods of time. Oh, it's like an ex- an excessive binge. Yeah, and they weren't and they didn't gain weight. And they found yeah found a way to block this. So they're trying to claim that you can block this and eat go to bananas. I so saw what, this. What they what? found is that this gene, uh, it, it when you inhibit it, you Im- you the body expends calories as heat rather than storing them as fat. So in es- in essence, giving them a you know for lack of a better term a faster metabolism. Oh, you know what this reminded me oh, of? When the God. science around uh, lipotropic came out, yeah. when we used to say that, you know, this is the most common place that your body stores fat in the liver, and instead of it storing fat in the liver, you would then transport it, it into yeah. the bloodstream and then utilize it as energy. Mm-hmm. Is it something like that, Sal? Is that what we're seeing? Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm trying to read up more about it, but, I mean, in this article it says that removing this gene had two major effects that they that they noticed. It reduced storage of fat, and then it caused muscles to burn more calories at rest. So you're just basically wasting- You're going to waste away. Yeah, well, you're wasting more calories in essence. You're becoming less efficient, which in the context of modern life may be a good thing because we're so exposed to so much food and we don't move that Mm. much. But here's my little, you know, my, uh, my warning, I guess. First off, it's done on animals. Yeah. So we don't know what this would mean for humans. But second off, we don't know what the side effects of that are or, exactly. or other effects. And so now you're talking about manipulating genes, the whole CRISPR thing again, mm. right? So this this has to happen uh, as, you know, like the, the um, you're dealing with the egg and everything else and you're trying to like um, take it and extract out the gene while then implanting it back into the mother, right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean- 
theoretically, you could design a drug that inhibits the actions of this particular oh, gene I now see. that they've isolated it. But again, there's always uh, remember, cause and effect. Yeah, yeah. So always. What would that cause? You know, maybe it'll cause issues with the brain later on because mm-hmm. you know storing fat isn't just storing fat. There's a whole process that goes into that. And there's that, a reason why your body does it. Yeah. So <laughs> it's but, advantageous for us. You, you feel satisfied. Yeah, but who knows, man? I mean, who knows what this could lead to? But people are tagging me left and right because, of course, people are excited. You that become psychotic. There could yeah. be a drug that would let you eat whatever you want. And not gain any. Could you imagine, just for a second, it's never there, gonna work. If there really was, let's just pretend, because I highly doubt this would happen. But let's just pretend there was a drug that did that, and there were no side effects. You just took it and ate whatever you wanted. Some of the other side effects involved with that would be psychological, if you ask me. Yeah, you'd have a bunch of shitty eating patterns because people now could eat whatever they want and not gain weight, and so they're just gonna gorge the shit out of themselves. And does that also mean that you're not getting the negative health effect? Forget the fat gain. You're still eating things that are unhealthy, kind right? Of, well, you we, may you may just be insatiable too. Mm. You know, you may just like you could never. It's like a bottomless pit that you could never fill. Sure, sure. You know, is it is it worse? Which what what is worse, that or remember we talked about this maybe I think two two maybe three years ago that that surgery that people were having where they could just eat whatever. Oh, aspire assist. Yeah, yes, yeah, that one. Whatever oh, happened? What to a that? horrible idea. It's, I think it's approved. Yeah. I think people are actually doing that. Where they just, they eat and then they puke through their stomach. Yeah. <laughs> they puke. That's what it is. Yeah. They're pretending like it's not. No, no it's the same thing it, as bulimia. It is. They're just extract. Yeah. They're just allowing you a tube to be able to yeah. like shuttle it out of your so stomach. So I wonder what's worse. Uh, it's all, yeah. it's what, all just. What, what is worse? None of it's like solving the root. You no. know what I mean? It's all just patches, patching on. You know, it's like a boat with like water poking through the holes and they're just like <laughs> sticking stuff over the holes to stop it Hammering from. corks in there. It's funny yeah. how science kind of comes full circle, I feel like. I feel like the more we learn, the more we educate ourselves, the more we kind of find out like the things that we were doing, you know, I 500 think, years ago. Yeah, I think people really, I mean, they want to solve these these problems and we see these all as problems and it's, they're trying to do it in a way that seems like it's, a magic pill or it's, it's something quick that they can apply and then it's going to have all this great result out of it where almost across the board, there's always work that has to be done to get there. We just want the easier. It's like, it's like people banging their head against the wall and scientists keep designing better and better helmets. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Here, put this helmet on. This will prevent you from... Yeah, yeah no, that one's kind of good, but yeah, 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 that one's better. Just stop banging your head against the wall. How about that? Yeah, let's do that. This Quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory-tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk-free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. First question is from Gary Pratt. If you had unlimited amounts of time to spend in the gym, how would you train for maximum results? Oh, easy. Easy. I would do, I would be in the gym more than once a day. I would do like an old school type double split type routine, which I've actually done in the past. I do this all the time, actually, today. I, st- mm. I do. I actually do this a lot, and it's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm not in this like hardcore try and make gains and change my physique. I'm really more about maintaining, navigating through the holidays, and my passion and love right now is elsewhere. It's in the business. It's in snowboarding. So I'm my my training is like super minimal right mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. and sometimes it's a, a 20 minute little lift. But then I'll go back later on, and then I'll do something else. And then later on, I'll do something else. Just when I find a few minutes, I can get away. And sometimes that's body weight stuff. Sometimes it's some barbell movements. But just like you were, you're alluding to, Sal, I think – and I for sure did, would never do this in the past. I used to think that – you got to go to the gym. You got to have this one hour of like getting after it. And then it's like the more I can do with that. And it's like, no, sometimes just getting there and, you know, doing four or five sets of squats. I and- love taking my time. You yeah. know, that, there's nothing that makes me more happy than being in a gym and having nothing but time on my hands. Like, that's a great feeling. Oh, then, it is. Because then you could just prime properly. I could like ease my way into and start ramping up my intensity like properly. And that's when I have my best lifts. But I just. I mean, you just aren't afforded that 
amount of freedom. Like, you know, you used to have maybe when you're younger, didn't have as many responsibilities, the job, all that kind of stuff in the way. But uh, I, I used to really enjoy that, man, taking my time and like being there for a couple hours. Well, there's something to be said about being able to come back to the gym, like and and modify your intensity. Like I, I think yeah, I, like if you had all the time in the world, just like he's asking, like yeah, if you have all the time in the world and you want to maximize. I think I shared this. Well, this was a, a, you know, we talk about all these moments in our career of training that like a light bulb went off for me. And this, I had to be, I want to say around twenty six ish. And I, for the first time ever, I had taken like a, a week or 10 days off of work, but I didn't leave town. I stayed in town and I had nothing planned. It was like, I'm just going to not work. And so, of course, I love training like we all do. And I'm like, I'm going to go to the gym. And I went to the gym like two, three times a day. And like, but what it looked like, it wasn't like I hammered the gym three times a day. I went in, walked on the treadmill, primed my body, stretched the back then. I didn't know it was priming. I was just kind of warming the body up to get ready to lift. I'd get a really good lift in for 30 to 45 minutes. Then I would go eat, go home for a little bit, relax, for a little, come back, and I came back to them. I was doing that every day for this like 10-day period. And man, the the gains that I saw in that short amount of time. And I also didn't feel like I – here's the key, though, that you got to be careful – is I do think that if you had all the unlimited time, it is this kind of split routine mm-hmm. of coming, you know, at least twice in a day, being able to split the body up a little bit. I do think it's ideal, but then it's very important that you modify the intensity. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because you can't go balls to the wall morning and night every single day, but you definitely can if you, and ideally, if you have all the time in the world, modify the intensity and come in. Yeah, because the way because I've actually done this in the past where, you know, when I've had, uh, when I used to own the uh, part gym in, uh, down in, in Southern California and I'd be there all day long, I'd work out in the afternoon and then I'd work out again in the evening after work. And the way I would break it up is I would do my heavy compound lifts for the, the, the what I used to call the bulk workout or the main workout. And then later on, I'd come back and hit the smaller body parts with right. the more isolation type stuff. And I had some of the best gains that I ever, ever had in my entire life. And it's funny because studies will, will – like for cardio, for example, they've done studies on cardio where they find if you just do an hour of cardio versus if you do two 30-minute sessions, it's more effective to do two, two 30-minute sessions. Mm-hmm. Spread with, it out. With resistance training, I think that can be very true. Now, of course, the, the drawback to it is not – you don't have all the time in the world to do. But yeah. I think everybody, if they, if they can dedicate a particular period of time – like a month or two months or whatever to really just maximizing results. Try it out. Go to the gym. Do your whole workout, but break it up into two workouts yeah. and, and and see what happens. The results are – this is how guys used to train in the 70s. Yeah, I definitely think the way that you describe is more ideal going with the compound, heavier lifts first, and then uh, you know following that up with more of the accessory lifts. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I've even like just personally – because of having a gym in my house, have been able to do like a 10 minute, 15 minute sesh, go do stuff, come back, hit it again, 10, 15 minutes, go out. I'll do four or five sessions in a day. And it's been going great. Like it's, it's super like energizing. That's what I meant, how I'm training right now. But I would love to write a program one day that is the like the most for the gym if you like, yeah i'm gonna live in there i'm gonna right. come back if you later. had all the time yeah. in the world like what is the most optimal way to yeah. be training but i i I'm, i still feel very happy with the the order that we have released programs because i would never want to present a program like that to our audience first mm-hmm. because i think that before you start because ninety percent of the people won't be able to get that much time. Ninety mm-hmm. percent of the people won't be able to come in the morning and come later on the evening. But I, there is a small percentage of people that either one are at a certain time in their life that yeah. they can allot that much time inside the gym, or two are competitive and like how would you? Because once oh, I, I used to do it for off training for football, like and it was tremendous for the amounts of gains that I got. Well, once I got to the and I waited, so this was not at the amateur level. This was not even when I first went pro. But as as I when I was back by the time I was on to my second pro show, this is a lot how I was training. I was going to the gym twice in a day. But mm-hmm. I mean that was after you know, two, three years of consistently scaling up to that. And then once I had reached that, that, that was like the kind of the next step was, okay, if I'm going to increase my volume more than I have been over the last two, three years, 
how should I do that? Well, the most optimal way was, okay, I need to start dividing these workouts up Mm -hmm. in two and then modifying the intensity in the morning and the uh, evening. Well, so like, uh, I'll give you an example of one of Arnold's uh, split routines. Now, Arnold, he used to hit the whole body three days, uh, uh, three times a week. So he'd, he'd make sure to hit chest, back, shoulders, legs, everything three times a week. But he also did a shit ton of volume. He was also doing 15 to 25 sets per body part. Mm. So the only way to go into the gym and to do all the all that volume and hit the body three times a day uh, a week meant you'd have to go to the gym twice a day. Otherwise, you're working out for three hours or right. you know for two hours. So like one of his splits was on days one, three, and five. In the morning, he'd go chest and back, and then in the evening would be legs, calves, and abs. You know, and then two, four, and six shoulders, triceps, and biceps in the AM, and then calves and abs in the evening. But if you think about it, like let's say you go to the gym and today is Let's say it's a typical, you know, push type split, right? I'm doing chest, shoulders, and triceps. And I do chest in the morning, and that's a body part I really want to develop. I can come back. I'm a couple hours later, I'm more fresh. I probably fed myself. Now I'm gonna have shoulders and triceps. You're gonna you're gonna have a, a much better workout, I think, because what it tends to happen with really long workouts is towards the end of the workout, you start to kind of peter out a little bit. You well, start to lose your Especially energy. when you, you give an example like you just did. Like if you go after your chest really hard, you know, and the first that's your first exercise, you're doing, you know, flat bench or incline bench or whatever, and you do three to five or more sets potentially. And then you ask yourself to go over and do an overhead press or to do mm-hmm. do triceps. Well, the, your triceps and shoulders are incorporated in that heavy bench. And if you really got after it in your bench, there's no doubt that it's going to be fatigued a little bit when you go to shoulders mm-hmm. and triceps. So if you allow yourself that recovery time throughout the day and then come back, oh, the, the amount that you'll be able to give towards your shoulders yep. and triceps is significantly higher if you were to couple them with that. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind that if I had all the time in the world, and that's, that was my goal, my routine would probably consist of two resistance training workouts a day, uh, one that would be heavier and with harder exercises, one that would be easier. And then I'd probably incorporate another mobility stretching type session in that day. I mean, we're talking ideal situation. Well, yeah, right? but let's also, I think it's important to know um, that even if that you had all the time in the world and you do that, you still would scale to that, right? Like, I don't, like personally. Oh, you're not jumping in that yeah, right out the gate. Yeah, like no if I'm way. talking to somebody who's, you know, an amateur lifter, you haven't been lifting in the gym very consistently. There's no reason for me to put that much de- that much time in the gym with that person. Like I'm going to still work you through red, green, black. Yeah, you got to work up. Then, to you're just gonna fry yourself. Then map split, and then heading. Mm-hmm. Then I would head into that direction. Like it makes the most sense, and that that means you've got over a year of consistent lifting and scaling volume mm-hmm. before I would then split into a double workout and increase my volume even more. Yeah, I know I, I know that the Olympic lifters of the the old Soviet era Olympic lifters, you know, where they used to call it the Iron Curtain, right? Where they were behind yeah. uh, a lot of their training modalities weren't shared during the Cold War because it was such a competitive time. Once the Iron Curtain fell, once the Soviet Union kind of broke apart we started to learn a lot of their training method methodologies and what they would do and why they were creating and producing athletes that were just dominating in a lot of these strength sports. And there's a lot of things that they did. So yeah. there's, it's not just this. Like, uh, a, all across the board. There's a lot of stuff that they did. But one of the things that they did is they would do, they would train all day. Mm-hmm. They, would, they would literally have multiple sessions a day of training and their athletes were producing tremendous amounts of progress and strength and they would uh, hit the that room. right amount of volume and, you know, that right dosage to where even they wouldn't even need a recovery, full recovery day. They would just keep going and mm-hmm. the, you really wouldn't, they wouldn't stop training. Like it was like year round. Next question is from the Dave Lifestyle. How often should a specific exercise change? For example, when should you change from a standard squat to a sumo squat or a stiff-legged deadlift to a conventional deadlift? That's a good question. This is a great question because there's kind of a couple schools of thought. Like you have the whole, you know, muscle confusion, I hate that word, uh, school of thought, which is change it as often as possible to keep your body adapting. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a subscriber to that school of thought because there's a, you need a- speci- You never really get good at something. There you go. You need a specific amount of time. You need a particular amount of time to get good at an exercise to maximize its benefits. Like- if I take someone who's never barbell squatted 
It's going to take a while for them to get good at barbell squatting. And then when they g- get good at barbell squatting, then we really see like the Mac, like the results really start to kick in. Now I can push them yeah. with the squat. Whereas in the beginning, it's really getting used to the movement, feeling it out. And you're still, imp- by the way, you're still improving that whole time. It's just they weren't good enough at that movement to really maximize uh, the type of results that that movement can produce. So what I always say to people is the best time to switch exercises is when you're really good at the one you're doing. Like when I feel really good at what I'm doing, move, change to another to another exercise and get really good at that one mm-hmm. and then what ha- watch what happens to your body. The other time that I'll change is when I start to notice uh, mobility issues and, and, and nagging aches and pains and yeah. – you know, like if I'm if I'm only doing barbell squats and I feel really really good at them, and I'm getting carried away, and I start to notice my hips start to get a little tight, uh, especially at the top uh, where you know where where the IT band can is up uh, up by the hip, and I start to feel like stiff in that area, then I know I need to switch movements, and then I'll typically go to like a split stance exercise. That's almost every time I, I go to switch and, and try you know a different exercise when I start to feel the achiness and, and the dull sort of pain uh, as a result of just doing the same repetitive movement all the time. And so, uh, yeah, I love to I love to switch up you know barbell squats and um, you know change that up and do like a zercher squat or focus more on front loaded squats or you know you're talking about stiff legged deadlifts going into conventional deadlifts it's it's a matter of 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 that time period of like really devoting yourself so you get good at the skill of it but then realizing that okay now um you know like these aches and pains are are happening as a result of like constantly doing the same movement Mm -hmm. adam i i used to be in the camp of changing you everything. You were the confusion guy. I was muscle yeah. confusion guy. And and a lot of that, there, there's some benefits to that. The benefits to that that I saw was I never really dealt with aches and pains. I um, uh, was great at exercising, um, but I was never great at any of those movements. And I didn't realize how much the gains would come on when I began to get really good at the movements like you were saying. And so none of you really touched on a time frame, which so I want to, because I have found that it falls somewhere between about four to six weeks of consistently keeping an exercise in there. I so, can get behind that. So that was, that, that's been something that I've kind of stayed true to for since I put that together. Like I was muscle confusion guy forever, felt great, thought I looked pretty great. Um, never really trained low rep ranges, never really stuck with just barbell squatting or, you know, sumo squatting for, you know, weeks on end. It was like, it would just be intermittently thrown into my routine. Like, oh, I haven't squatted in a while, throw it in there. And then mm-hmm. it's gone. And then, oh, I haven't sumo daily, just throw it in there. It's gone. Like it would never stay consistently in my routine for weeks on weeks. So I could build on it. And once I did do that, uh, and this was kind of when I started getting into the, the five by five type of training whoa, it just blew my mind on how, especially with those lifts. When you talk about overhead press, you talk about bench press, you talk, which that one was probably one I did do all the time, but uh, uh, overhead press, squatting and deadlifting, uh, I would say are the three big ones that I neglected getting good at. And when I started to put a lot of energy into that, I saw the gains come on like crazy. But then like everything else I do, you know, I fall in love with that protocol and I was sticking to just that protocol for too long of a time. And then Sal, you touched on it, the aches and pains mm-hmm. started and the, and the, the, and the gains would, would stall. And so I would play with this, like how long then do I stay with this movement? And for me, and that's why I gave a, a range, I think it's, and it's unique to each individual, but I seem to see the most results within that kind of four to six you know, uh, range of sticking to a movement. It gives me the first week is like totally filling it out. Like you haven't done, if you haven't done a sumo deadlift in a long time or ever, the first like two to three times of doing it is like, you're going to suck at it. Yeah. You suck at it. Like the movie, I'm not going really, really heavy. And even if I think it's heavy, it's nowhere near what my max, my max is that I may think it is because I'm struggling with it. But part of why I'm struggling with it is because I'm not, I'm not perfecting the movement yet. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm training really hard, but I'm not training. I'm not training that movement to its max, its max capacity. And so I really feel like the first probably week to two weeks 
at the minimum is kind of finding your groove. Mm -hmm. And then weeks three and four, you're starting to hit your stride. And then I feel like weeks five and six, you start hitting your peak. And then if you continue going on with that movement and pushing more and more weight and pushing more weight, that's when I would start to find the aches and the pains like you mentioned. Now, that being said, I will say this. This is It's more true for certain exercises and less true for other exercises. For sure. For example, if if I'm going to go in and pick a bicep exercise, it's not as important that I stick to the same bicep exercise to get really good at it. It's a it's a single joint movement. It's pretty easy. I'm I'm not going to get that much benefit from, from just doing barbell curls till I get really good at them before I switch. I might be okay going with a cable or a machine or whatever. Same thing with other isolation exercises. But the big compound movements that require a lot of skill, I guess the way I'll say it is this. If it's a movement that requires a lot of skill, you're better off sticking to it and getting good at it before you switch. If it's a low skill exercise, switching them around, yeah, does, interchange them pretty easy. Yeah, it doesn't make that big of a difference. I mean, I could do five different isolation movements for my chest, different variations of flies with cables and machines and squeezing and this, that, and the other. It's not going to make that big of a difference if I stick to an exercise or if I switch around. In fact, switching it around may, may actually be beneficial in that particular case. But the complex movements, it takes a while to get good at them, and it takes a while to maximize the benefit you're going to get out of them. So it's it's smart to stick to them for a while, get really good at them before switching to something else. But I have a a, a story around this. You know, I, I I'm everybody knows I like to deadlift. It's one of my favorite exercises. When I first started deadlifting, I, I was a sumo deadlifter. That's the way that I was taught. Then I went to conventional and and I never looked back. I always did conventional deadlifts. Well, a long time ago, I was trying to get my deadlift up to 600 pounds. I tried all these different things. And somebody, you know, I read an article and someone said, try sumo deadlifting. So here I was being able to routinely pull uh, in the mid fives, conventional. I went to sumo and I had, I was struggle pulling anything over 425. And it was mainly because of what, like you were saying, Adam, I just wasn't good at it. I hadn't sumo deadlifted in a very, very long time. I, I could tell I wasn't good at it. And I could tell I couldn't really maximize my force production or my strength. So I dedicated some time to sumo deadlifting. And my goal was to get my sumo deadlift over 500 pounds. And it took me a matter of weeks. I think it took me like four or five weeks of practice. I mean, I had the strength, obviously I could pull conventional, but it took me about four or five weeks to be able to do that with a, with the sumo. Then when I was able to do the sumo, I went back to conventional and my conventional went up uh, by about five or 10 pounds, which might not have happened had I not done that. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is just something that, to pay attention to, especially with the complex lifts. I've noticed that too. And I was uh, thinking about it in uh, it's a longer period. So you mentioned four to six and it, whether it's like somewhere around 12 weeks um, where I'll, I'll, I'll go back to unilateral training. And then mm -hmm. that's something that I like to do that because um, that has, it's, it's a nice break, uh, you know, for the body to then focus on, you know, less loading, but then also it's, it's very much more high stability and it's, it's, it, you know, you're isolating these these muscles quite a bit more, but uh, that has massive carryover for me then to come back, uh, you know, to bilateral type movements, these compound lifts, and I found that to be very beneficial. I guess it's the difference between training the muscle and then training the movement. Mm -hmm. And some exercises mm -hmm. that's a good way of putting do it. a really good job of training the movement. Like I'll give you an, it's a very very uh, clear example, like an Olympic lift, like a clean. A clean is not a muscle. You're not trying to isolate a muscle. You're trying to perfect the movement. Right. So that's an exercise that you practice over and over and over again. Now, there's some truth to that with things like barbell squats and barbell deadlifts, for example. Although there are specific muscles you're working, you do get a lot out of just practicing the movement. And I would say to the average lifter, you're probably better off going to the gym and just practicing the movement than you are trying to squat and feel it in your quads. You're probably better off just practicing the movement. Mm. But other exercises, it's really about trying to train the muscle isolation mm -hmm. exercises in particular. Like if I, I'm not really trying to perfect a leg extension as much as I'm trying to feel my, my quads squeeze and whether I try this leg extension machine or that leg extension machine or try different ones every time I work out, it's not gonna make that big of a difference. And the fact that I'm feeling the muscle and squeeze that may actually benefit me more than trying to perfect the movement. So it depends on the exercise. And I guess a good rule of thumb is the more complex and the more skill that is involved with the exercise, the longer you want to stick with it before you switch over, the less complex and the less skill that's involved, the quicker you can switch between movements. Great advice. Yeah. Next question is from Joe Burns. 
Do you think cardio can benefit someone with the goal of building strength? If so, what are some good ways to incorporate cardio into a strength training plan that will not interfere mm -hmm. with the strength adaptation? Yeah, I, I picked this question because we, we talk about cardio so much and how it can cause negative you know, or perceived negative adaptations because they're all, they're all just adaptations uh, to the body where if you just do lots and lots and lots of cardio and that's the, the cornerstone of your workout, you'll, your body will start to burn less body fat as a result, slow down its metabolism by paring down muscle. And so now people are like, oh, cardio is evil, stay away from it altogether. Well, where, does, where does stamina help? You know, within lifts. So it's like that that is an important component to the entire process of working out, right? So if I want – if I'm thinking about work capacity, for instance, and this is something that we – like some people were surprised at the volume right out of the gates for our strong program, for instance. But in order to then get the muscle to, you know, respond and be able – like what's what's the first thing to fail when you're when you're going through these heavy lifts, you know, is it is it the stamina of it? Is it the strength? You know, dips that you um, you go through. There's all these types of uh, uh, you, you know processes that you 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 identify and you see. And so this is a this is a vital component to that entire process. It is stamina. I, I remember a long time ago. I mean, I was always I was never trying to lose weight ever. I was always trying to gain. Always trying to gain. Obviously, insecure about being skinny. So it was always about gaining size. So I didn't touch cardio ever at all. And I just wanted to build muscle and get stronger. And there was this trainer that worked for me years ago. It was a long time ago. So I was in my, in my I want to say my early, early to mid twenties. And he was just this muscular ripped dude. And every once in a while after the workouts, he would do like some sprints or he'd do some cardio. And, uh, you know, because he was so muscular, I was more apt to hear his advice. And so we'd go back and forth and he's like, you know, cardio is good for you. It's good for your health. And I'd be like, yeah, but I don't care about that. I just want to build muscle. He's like, well, if you get healthier, you're probably going to build more muscle. And so the reason why I listened to him, of course, was because he was jacked. And so I did a little bit of cardio. And I remember getting on the bike and getting out of breath because I never done, I never did cardio. So I had such bad endurance and stamina. But I started doing it a little bit. And I was, it wasn't much. I was doing 20 minutes after my workouts. But I noticed after about a week, I didn't have to, I didn't have to rest as long in between my sets. In my when I would lift, and I could do high rep squats much easier, mm -hmm. and as a result of that, I was building more muscle, and that's right. when it really started to occur to me, like, oh shit, yeah, there's a carryover to it. All of this, there's all of that's a carryover. So I think cardio is an important aspect of being healthy, even if your goal is to build maximal muscle. Don't do tons of cardio. No, great. This is what I used to recommend: twelve minutes post workout hit. That was like my way to get the get your work capacity up, like you're saying right now. Increase your stamina, get the, the get the calorie burn, but then also not send, don't spend an hour of this long these long bouts of cardio that you start to send a conflicting signal to the body on what it's supposed to be adapting to. I don't want to do that. I want to build some stamina. I want to be explosive. I want to increase my my gas tank. What a great way to do it. Train for the first 45 minutes to my hour, get all my lifting in that I want to. Post workout, I go straight over to some sort of a cardio piece of equipment and I run 12 minutes a hit. Mm -hmm. And that right there will give me that without having all the the, the fears of, you know, doing these long bouts of cardio that we talk about. That Basically, could, what you're what you're doing if your goal is maximal strength, maximal muscle, you're not doing cardio to get really good at cardio. No. Okay, so that's not the goal. You're not doing cardio like, oh my God, next time I'm going to push my time even further. I'm going to see how much better. That's not the, 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 that's not the cornerstone of your workout because you're trying to get build, build muscle and get stronger. The cornerstone is the weights. So that's where you really push your performance. Right. The cardio should be used as a way to get healthy mm -hmm. and to be healthy. And to be quite honest, that you go for a walk. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't yeah. need to do a lot. Yeah, that counts. Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. Yeah, and it's... And it is. It's just it's benefiting the overall. So you have your structure of strength as your focus. That's the majority always. Mm -hmm. And then you you intermittently or you you add in like Adam's saying just a few minutes there to you know address it. But yeah, you're not you're not like uh, competing with cardio and strength training. But you're not also avoiding it like it's kryptonite. Yeah, you're not like, avoiding it because no. I used to know guys that would literally. And actually, I I used to do this as a teen. Uh, because I don't want to burn any extra calories. I would lift weights and I would purposely be sedentary for the rest of the day. Yeah. Because yeah. I was so afraid 
of burning any extra calories and needs like to conserve them. It's like your atypical power lifter. Right. But the reality of that is you're going to build, you'll actually build less muscle if you go that far. Right. Like if you go to the gym and you lift weights really, really hard and then you stay in bed until your next workout session, like you don't leave your bed, you'll build less muscle than if you're up and moving and you go for a hike and you do some work around the house. Well, of course. And kind of it's, it's, it's almost, it should be common knowledge when you think about it. I mean, you get up, you move, more oxygen, more blood would equals more nutrients to the muscle. More nutrients to the muscle means faster recovery, more muscle. It's like, I, you know, I, when I would train competitors and I would say Melissa, Rochelle, as far as girls that, that uh, worked with me, I would say are the, were the best at adhering to this. Like what we would do is I would find out where their, their normal movement steps were in a day and all the way through their entire program, I would just incre incrementally move their steps up until it got to the point that we needed to get on a piece of cardio to, uh, to acquire those steps. It was always just go for walks. Like if you're at 5,000 steps and now I'm asking you to be at 7,000, don't get on a piece of cardio equipment. Just go for walks throughout your day, whether that's be one long walk or five little 10 minute walks or, you know, ma making the conscious effort to park further away, whatever it, you need to just keep scaling that. And then eventually, you know, like with someone like Melissa, where we're got a long prep and, and program where we've done multiple shows, you know, she eventually is going from all the way from five, 6,000 steps all the way up to like 22,000 steps. Then at that point, you know, there's days where she'd be at school or at work all day long. And so she'd be like, out of my, I have to go get on a piece of cardio equipment to achieve that. Okay, well, now let's get on that piece of cardio equipment to achieve that. But the benefits that you get from cardio mm -hmm. are not that much greater than just walking more and moving more. It's that we live in this society now that we sit all fucking day long, and anybody who's ever paid attention and actually tracked their movement. I mean, most people are only moving 4,000 steps. That's fucking nothing. Mm -hmm. You could get on a piece of cardio equipment for 30 minutes, you surpass that. So know, that no, no shit cardio is beneficial to most people. And that's mm -hmm. why they recommend it to so many people. And that's why the studies show the health benefits around it. Well, you'd be surprised how healthy you would be if you just walked for an hour or two hours every single day, how amazing that would be for your heart. That's right. Next question is from Manda Henry. Do you guys have any plans to add a female voice to the podcast team? Why did you pick yeah, this it's question? Funny. It's funny. It's <laughs> funny you say that. We just I, I, we got we got Justina on the show. I've just been I've been holding out. I've been waiting <laughs> for my opportunity to voice my concerns. That's the, all this masculinity. That's the worst female voice ever. Uh, what are you talking about? Man? You know what makes me mad about? I hate this question. Why is this not considered sexist? It, it, it is. <sighs> Uh, Why is this not considered a sexist it is. question? It actually. is because it's funny. The same, the same. You know, I apologize to whoever's. At, we're not hammering on you, but nah, was, I'll tell you it's what. A very he's using as an example because we get it a lot. People, the, these are the same people that are like we're all the same. Everything's equal. Everybody's equality. But then they want a somebody to to be on who is just a different yeah. gender, as if that guarantees a different. You know, it'd be great if you were an Eskimo, one. Adam. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Um, like, why does that matter? I know that being a female can provide different points of view, but it doesn't guarantee it. You know, everybody's an individual. So I would love to have, uh, you know, a female person on the show. Look, I'll put it this way. If Justin or Adam was a girl, they'd still be on the show. Of yeah. course. You know what I mean? It, it, the fact that, that we're keep all- keep this dynamic what it is for sure. Yeah. The fact that everybody's a guy has zero to do with why we're all doing this together at all. That, that wasn't even in my mind. I didn't even think to myself like, oh, cool. I'm going to work with these- People, oh wait, are they? Oh yeah, they're all men. We're all good then. <laughs> I could give a shit. It doesn't matter if you guys were girls and I met you and we start, and we all or like off. we're not considering the needs of of females too. It's like we're always thinking about everybody. The thing yeah. that sucks though is you know, and I was just having this conversation with Danny. Right, Danny stayed at my place while he came down to shoot with us, and I was kind of telling him the overall vision of the YouTube channel, and I said to him, I said, you know, um, I could really use your help trying to find someone just like you, exactly like you, but a female. Like I, the, the traits that I think are, are really good about you, you're very, very intelligent, you articulate your points well, uh, you, and you, uh, you have a good, a good look to you. Good delivery. Yes, when yeah. you look at, you have this ability to look at the camera and, and, and deliver your point well, um, education, a good, great education. So I'm looking for that. Like I'm looking for, the sad part is I'm looking for just a female version of him mm -hmm. to appease to this type of a question. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that I have to do that 
to appease people, but because it, it really doesn't. It's a to, reality. To, Just to, listen. Yeah. To, to me, it doesn't fucking matter that yeah. it's coming out of a female's mouth or at a male's mouth. If it's good information and it's delivered the way that it should be delivered, that's the that's the. Then desi- it's for everybody. That's a desire coming. You bet yeah. your ass. I wish that Justin was a hot chick sitting <laughs> across from me instead. I would. Run, if if yeah. if I could find a girl that literally talked just like him, delivered the message that he delivers, because that's the magic. And what happens in here, yeah. it's not like, oh, we picked a guy who has this types of knowledge and a guy that has this kind of knowledge and a guy that has this kind of... No, it's like we met three... Well, there's three people yeah. that have this chemistry about them that deliver a message that we want to get out to people. Their sex has nothing to do with it. And what would you say if I changed my sex? Yeah, mm-hmm. nothing. Right. Yeah, keep you on well, the show. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we and talk there's, about There's it. good female podcasts out there, and but like, do do they need a male representation? Yeah, I wonder if they get no. asked the same thing. That's a good question. I wonder if the like the women. There's not a lot of them, but I wonder if they get mess. We should have, we have girlfriends like that. that are that are in the, yeah, the I should ask podcasting them if space if they get that. It's question. Interesting. I don't feel like they do. Well, you know, it's the it's here's the reality. The reality is when you're listening to someone give you information, there's a part of you that. It's more effective when you can identify with them. For example, right. if I, when I was a kid, I get that. well, I remember, I want for, I'll give you an example for me, right? I remember watching uh, Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta. Part of the reason why I saw it, thought it was so cool is because a bunch of Italian dudes, and I identified <laughs> with that. Like, oh yeah, they're just like me. Like, yeah. But you know, there's, that doesn't mean that they're just like me at all. Right. But it's, it's just this natural instinct that we have. So like, if we, like our YouTube channel, if a female sees another female, saying something or presenting something and they look the way they want to look or whatever, it just makes it more effective. So I, I, I get that. I get it too. Yeah. It just makes it unfortunate. That's all. And I, I, I you know, and it's not ragging on this person because we do get this a lot. And yeah. I, I too, if somebody, if I was searching for how to get jacked and build muscle and I had the choice to listen to some petite 115 pound girl give the information and she could be probably smarter than this meathead looking guy most people were going to gravitate over to yeah, the be challenging, right? It's a, and 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 that's unfortunate. It's yeah. unfortunate because she could have way better information than the information he's presenting, and that's the world we live in. But the 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 fact of the matter is, Mind Pump is all about dispelling that bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like that's a lot of our like we would sell way more programs if they were blue and pink, blue and pink. In fact, marketing companies have come to us and said to us, "Can you make a female version of this? Can you make a workout just for women?" And we're like, yeah. "It's the same as what the one mean? for." Yeah. Man, there's no difference. There's in the, a human workout. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a, a, and this also highlights kind of what's wrong with the fitness industry because the people who are being listened to are the ones that look the best. Oftentimes, they're not the ones with the best information. They tend to be the guys and girls who are shredded and look really good. And I remember oh, I, I, on radio, I feel it was necessary that I had to do what I did just to get something, some sort of traction for us. I don't know if we would. I don't know if we'd be here today. Had I not gone to the extreme and showed everybody that on Instagram, look at me, so I got enough oh, eyes. no doubt that made a difference. Right. I, I mean, I don't know if it would, if we would have grown organically fast enough to get the traction that we did had we not done that. So, unfortunately, I had to play that game. And I feel like we spent, I spent the first fucking 400 episodes like getting people to understand like that's not who i am like Mm -hmm. i don't identify with that guy you know that guy is the guy that i knew i had to be in order to get the attention that we got so somebody would listen to what we had to say and it's like having a girl on the show i mean does that would that get more people to listen just because they know there's a girl on there i don't know Mm -hmm. you know here's the thing if if they have good stuff to say and they're smart awesome I really don't care if well, you're just, a guy or a girl. Yeah, and we that's why we always look, you know, out for guests and people that are making an impact and like smart women out there. Well, let's bring them on, and you know, let's bring that, you it, know, voice in here for sure. It's simply just a numbers game. Yeah. It's like we we're in a male dominated space. Mm-hmm. You know, if if we were in a, a you know, why are there not more male representatives in the makeup industry? Mm. Well, because there's not as many guys in it. You know, or is, does that make all the women that employ all the other women sexist? No, no it's just that it's ninety percent of the the sex that's in that in that space are a certain a certain sex. You just did a great post on this, Sal. You showed why aren't people why aren't we up in arms over and you listed all these jobs? <laughs> yeah, that are that, male dominated. That are male. They're ones that nobody wants to do, like logging. Yeah, and you know, steel working and and shit like that. Oil rigging. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, again, it's it's a male dominated space. There's not a whole ton of female representatives. 
Some of them are phenomenal. There's some that are phenomenal. Yep. And and I mean, I have no problem having anybody. I don't care who who you are. I don't care what you identify as. And as in fact, you could say you're non-gender. I don't give a shit. If you've got good information, good fitness information, you'll come on the show. Um, hey, but I will say this: although we are three dudes, uh, I think we do a good job being, you know, open and honest and, and vulnerable and all that other stuff. Well, I, that's I think it comes with. I think that comes with age too. I th- I think that's yeah. the the part that really makes the three of us really special is that we we we're not like normal guys. I mean, we we have this side to us that I think is very humanizing. We share our insecurities, and let me tell you something: this space is flooded with insecurities. It's fucking hard to find a, a male who isn't that way, much less a female mm. that d- isn't isn't riddled with insecurities and a lot of their message being distorted. So it's not a, a lack of not wanting to find these the, these women to come on here and speak, but it's tough for me to find those yeah, people that are It's aren't. a rarity in general. It's very, very rare. Yeah. I also would find it condescending, to be quite honest, for, and I know you guys will feel the same, uh, to add someone just because... You know what I mean? Like if we're sitting around a table like, okay, guys, how can we do this better? I'm like, I know. Right. We need to specifically find a female voice to bring on. And we brought someone on that wasn't good, but just because they're a girl, I think that would be very condescending. Yeah, we would, it would yeah. fuck the, deni- the dynamic up for sure. Yeah, yeah, Are you yeah. kidding me? Like, yeah. if, especially if all of us kind of knew that. Mm-hmm. I mean, and not to give a hard time to our boy Craig, but I mean, that's the reason why that didn't work out. I mean, it didn't work out because the synergy wasn't there. It wasn't mm-hmm. the lack of knowledge or information he could provide or value he could provide just the synergy wasn't there like it was the, with the three of us where we're at with and it, that wouldn't matter if he was a male or a female and if we just tried to insert somebody and we almost did that because he had way more clout than any of us it would have accelerated the business way faster to have someone like that yeah but it would probably have never grown to where it is had we forced that sure. the same thing would same thing is true if we were to insert a female voice, just for the sake of just it. for the sake of it being yeah. a female voice, so we can appease the you know handful of people that have a question like this yeah. all the time. Well, the thing I love about fitness and health and nutrition is there are specific things that apply to men and women, and there are things that apply to both. And exercise is one of those ones he, that applies to both. I also want to say that we get we, we whenever we get this, it tends to spark something for us because we're very like you know. I know we're responding to this question, but right away we'll hang these mics up and we'll go, Hey, you know what? we it's been a while since we've like revisited this. Let's, you know, reach out to some girls that would be, let's look for some girls that would be great right. uh, on the show. And whenever this, this happens, we, we have a tough time with this. We really, we really struggle with finding that. And then I get people, then we, we put it out there to the forum and we put it out for people to say, Hey, recommend these people. And I got to be honest, the people that they recommend just goes to show how little they actually know about that person. Cause I happen to know more about that person they're recommending and it's not somebody who I want representing on the show. Mm-hmm. And, and I think we all agree. We all go like, that's the, the three girls you guys gave us to reach out to an interview on the show. Nah, not the message, man. That's not it. Mm-hmm. The same way we go when someone references a guy that was put this guy on. Hey, you should interview this guy, and then mm-hmm. we, and we know that guy mm-hmm. or know a lot about that person. We're like, nah, not the person that we want to represent on the show. Well, so, the good the good news is you're seeing more and more uh, women enter into this the space, especially the new media space, because the barriers have been lowered, and you're starting to see more and more of that. But it still remains a, a kind of a male-dominated space. But I hope it changes. I really do. Uh, fitness is for everybody. Yeah. Uh, you know, health is for everybody. And I, you know, I have a daughter. And again, knowing that somebody tends to listen to another person because they identify with them more, you know, I would like to see more women representatives who are able to to, to give the right message mm-hmm. of you know strength and health and confidence. Um, so that more girls, you know, will listen because I think it's important. I think it's absolutely important. So, and we are always open to those suggestions. So even though I just kind of yeah, if we'll, you guys know anybody, we, shit, I DM mean, us. I've always, yep. I mean, we go through Please. all. The, anytime someone sends a DM or posts on the forum, like, hey, we would love to. We look at all of them just because we don't. You don't see them on the show. There's probably a reason for that, but we absolutely take all of them into consideration. We go and we research them after that if we don't know who they already are. So, And we appreciate that. Yeah. So if you've got people who you think would be great to hear their voice on the show, by all means, please send the DMs or send over an email to info at Mind Pump Media and, and uh, reference the people that you think would be a great voice to be on here. Would love it. Uh, and with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our free 
guides. Some of these will help you build your legs, your arms, your core, get leaner, get a stronger squat. There's like 12 guides. They're all available and they're all free. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.